Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for our monthly Meet the VC webinar. Today, we have a fantastic program scheduled for you with our VC, Garrett Goldberg of B Partners. Just a couple things as we kind of get kicked off and started. Today's webinar will last about 40 to 60 minutes long, depending on our question and answer portion. But you can feel free to ask your questions anytime using the question and answer chat button, and I will relay it back to the panel. You can feel free to use the chats to each other as well. You know, as of right now, you know, drop in your names, where you're from, get to know each other. You know, let us know if it's your first Meet the VC, if you've been here before. You know, we love getting to know you, getting to engage with you, saying hi, and we love having you back each month. It, it makes us really excited. Um, also, feel free to drop the name of your company, just one sentence description, and where you're dialing in from. I'm calling in from the Bay Area today, but I know a lot of our panelists and partners and guests are from New York, so we'd love to hear from where all of you are from. If for some reason you have to drop early or you'd like to pass this webinar on to your friends, it is being recorded and you can find it at our Early Growth YouTube channel. As we move on to our next part, as many of you know, Early Growth is your strategic partner, leading your finance and accounting team so you can focus on your business, customer service, and getting up and going. What we do is kind of everything from A to Z. We're finance and accounting, taxes, equity management, fund accounting, all the things that help you grow your business. We're the largest national firm in the venture capitalist space. As many of you who've been to these before know, it's not our first rodeo. For over 10 years, early growth has helped thousands of startups from your first round of funding to your exit, and we're there with you every step of the way. What many of you might know is we've also recently merged with Escalon, making us the largest global partner in this area. And we look forward to definitely working with you as you build your business. As I said, Early Growth wants to be your strategic partner, leading your finance and accounting so that you can focus on the important things, which is your customers, your team, and getting that business up and going. You can always reach out to us via these different message, methods, excuse me, you can also ask if you can reach out to any of our partners or our VC and our business development manager in the chat, and they can easily give you the information. As I mentioned, much like we want to be your partner, we could not be who we are without our incredible partners. And here to tell you a little bit about our partners and make an introduction is our moderator, Adam Roachman. Adam is a business development manager in New York. He's specifically focused on the referral channel, and he's been with Early Growth for one and a half years. He previously spent four years at Trinet advising tech startups as a sales consultant. He also served as a sales director for two foreign-based growth companies, and he currently lives in New York with his wife and his three boys, who, by the way, are absolutely adorable. So to kind of kick us off and tell us more about our partners, I'm going to bring Adam up onto the screen. So Adam, if you'd like to join us. Yes. Uh, and can there you see he me? is. I can, and I'm yeah, going to let you kind of take it from here great great well thank you very much Gina. that was an awesome intro um it's, it's awkward to not have to introduce myself but i guess i'll skip that part um very excited today we have a great we have a great event for you uh as gina said uh we're going to speak to garrett who uh who i do know and who's who's fantastic and uh, i think you guys will get a lot of insights from him and um hopefully i ask the right questions and feel free to you know fire in some q a as, as gina said uh but first before we get into that uh, of course, our partners always uh, a very, very important part of this, and we can't do it without them. So, what I'd like to do is just bring up uh, each one of them, just to introduce themselves. Uh, we do have I'll kind of go round robin from top to left: uh, Cushman and Wakefield, uh, First Republic Bank, uh, Venture Employer Services, of course, and Gunderson Detmer Law Firm. Um, what I would do, what I would recommend, is uh, everyone check out their websites and check out what they do, and you know, listen to. To the little blurbs here and uh, of course reach out if relevant. So let's start with Alejandra Alvarez of Fishman. Please feel free to uh, introduce yourself, take yourself off mute and all that good stuff. Thanks Adam, really appreciate it. Um, you know, it's great to be here. Thanks for everyone that's joined. Um, you know, our relationship with early growth, I guess goes back three or four years now. This is probably our 20th or so meet the VC with you guys. Actually, Adam, obviously we met a few years back when you were at Trina and you were a partner. Um, so it's exciting. It's great to see where the company continues to grow and how they've continued to help our clients as well. Um, and just to give you some background, again, Alejandro Alvarez, I'm at Cushman and Wakefield. Uh, we're part of a tech advisory, a tech advisory practice, really helping companies scale operations as early as 
you know, 10 people in a WeWork trying to figure out how to grow their business to as they rate seed round, series A, B, Cs, and post IPO. The, the idea is that we are a strategic partner. We help our clients really get through the pains of dealing with real estate and doing it in a flexible manner, right? Um, so as we look uh, and as we work with companies, you know, we, we work with LV Growth and, and helping them really diversify their, uh, you know, their need of money. Um, I guess, uh, um, cash flow projections, you know, with the finance and auditing stuff, uh, they've been a huge help. So again, a pleasure to be here. Any startups that need help, whether it's 10 people or 5,000 people, uh, we're happy to help and provide guidance and uh, feel free to reach out. I'll share my email. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks again, Adam. And thanks to, to the rest of the group. Looking forward to hearing from you, Garrett. Absolutely. Thanks, Alejandro. Yeah, and, and just to everyone who is has any questions about real estate or even just the tech market here in New York, feel free to reach out to Alejandro. He's a great resource. Uh, we've worked together on a lot of clients over the years, and uh, he's just an overall helpful guy. So uh, next Thanks, up, uh, you got it, man. First Republic Bank, uh, Barath Gorpasad, also First Republic, very, very important partner to, to us at Escalon Early Growth. Go ahead, Barath. Hey, Adam. Thanks for the introduction. Um, you know, obviously, yeah. we value our partnership. Um, other than talking about the New York Knicks, I know you, you and I have known each other for almost a year right now. Um, and, you know, we work with a lot of your clients. Um, I'm Bharat Guru Prasad. I'm the director of tech banking at First Republic Bank. We're a leading private and commercial bank that provides advisory solutions to early stage growth companies. Uh, some of the salient benefits um, that we have is a free 49A valuation, um, 10,000 AWS credits, 100,000 Google Cloud credits, and, and, then, and then there's no banking fees. Um, so if you're looking for banking services, feel free to reach out to Adam or myself. Um, you know, we're here for you from the early stages to your liquidity phase. Um, so feel free to reach out and early growth, as I mentioned before, has been a great partner. Thank you, Adam. You got it. Absolutely. All right. Thanks. Appreciate that, Barth. Uh, next, we have uh, our legal firm, Gunderson Detmer. And Aaliyah, please uh, unmute yourself. Hi, everyone. Uh, hopefully you all can hear me and see me. Um, so it's great to, to be here on this panel and to uh, kind of virtually meet you all. Uh, so I'm a senior associate at Gunderson Detmer and I'm based in the, the New York office, currently based in my downtown Brooklyn home office. Um, so just a bit about the law firm. Um, we've been ranked number one, the number one law firm globally for high growth technology and life sciences uh, companies and investors for the past seven years in a row. Uh, and we have more than 350 lawyers um, that are solely focused on, you know, venture capital, uh, growth equity, merging companies. So we kind of represent, you know, companies, uh, venture capital firms, um, you know, everything in between. Uh, and currently we have seven offices in the United States. Uh, we recently opened an office in, in Austin as well. Uh, and we have two uh, offices, one in Singapore and Beijing internationally. Um, and we represent currently more than 2,500 venture-backed companies in over 450 of the world's top venture capital and growth equity firms um, and thousands of their underlying funds. Uh, and we routinely negotiate uh, about one third of every venture capital dollar raised worldwide. And we're recognized generally as a global leader in representation of venture capital and growth equity funds in their investment activities. Uh, and we negotiate around a thousand, probably more venture and growth financings every year. Um, so we provide advice in every lifestyle, every um, stage of the life cycle. So, you know, starting from, you know, incorporation, seed financings, all the way through to exits, uh, IPOs, SPACs. Um, so the Gunderson is kind of, you know, looped in every stage of those transactions. So to the extent that uh, anyone here wants to reach out with any questions in terms of more the legal side of things, I'm happy for any of you to reach out to me. I'll put my info in the chat box as well. Uh, so please feel free to reach out with any questions uh, that you may have for, for uh, the lawyers who can, can help out with this process. Awesome. Thank you, Julia. That was awesome. That was great. Last but absolutely not least, uh, Venture Employer Services. Uh, my friends, Curtis Stanton and Josie Malpey, who I've known for quite a few years. Uh, Josie, I believe, is going to be taking the mic here, but go for it, Josie. Awesome. Thank you, Adam. 
Good afternoon to everyone. It's nice to virtually meet you. Adam and I have actually known each other for just about eight years, I think going on eight, nine years from our former life at Trinet and at Venture here. We are a actually the nation's fastest growing PEO or professional employer organization, providing a full range of spectrum of HR services from payroll to fully outsource or to employer record if you're international looking to open up um, a US location. And what's great about what we do is it's very flexible. Um, I always tell companies I've been working with that you know once you, you have your idea, you're getting funding, you have a concept, you start hiring people, this is when you know, the biggest challenge really comes of running your business is the compliance, the complexities of making sure your employees are getting paid, that they have benefits, that you are competitive out there. As you know, it's a very competitive hiring landscape right now. Um, how to onboard employees virtually. Venture employer services can help you do that from payroll to benefits to risk and safety mitigation um, and just help connect you to other great um, other great partners as you see on this panel. So we're excited to partner with Early Growth and uh, to help you in all of your business strategic needs. Fantastic, great. Yeah, as a, as a former veteran of the PEO industry, uh, Venture, is as good as it gets. They're the ones right now. So if you uh, if you have any questions about PEO or any anything on that side of the business, uh, even if you're a year out from thinking you need it, definitely reach out to them. They are they are fantastic. Uh, okay, so let's uh, let's get started here, uh, Garrett, and uh, I will. I'm going to introduce Garrett. Obviously, um, that's what we do here. No one introduces themselves except for the partners. But we, uh, so just really quickly, I'm just going to read his little bio just so you can get some background on him above and beyond what you're looking at here. But Garrett Goldberg is a partner at Beep Partners. Uh, it's a pre-stage fund, a venture capital firm focused on supporting passionate founders with deep market insights at the start of their journey. So seed and pre-seed, as you'll, as you'll learn. Uh, he focuses on identifying founders and startups that are working hard on technology problems that service enterprises and enable new marketplaces. He actively seeks investments in frontier technologies, AI, drones, new space, and invests his time in building companies that matter. He is a partner to the founders and organizations in the B community that he believes and, and believe that time is worth more than money. I know that I do. Uh, he's an entrepreneur at heart. Garrett has worked in professional sports, real estate development, technology, uh, has a BA from Stanford, MBA from the Foster School uh, at University of Washington. Yeah. And he is, he may or may not tell you, he was originally from a ski town, uh, but that doesn't <laughs> necessarily mean that if you are a founder from a ski town, that you should reach out to him. Uh, nice. I'll let him get more into that. Um, and that's pretty much it. I'm going to stop talking now because I know you guys want to hear Garrett anyway. Uh, and the last thing I know, Garrett, I know you don't like to uh, talk about yourself too much, but we're going to, we're going to bypass that just for today. And uh, if you nice. could just, yeah, if you don't mind just giving a brief intro on, of course, your background. Uh, you know, be partners, the fund, all that good stuff. Please do have at it. Yeah, you bet. Uh, first of all, thanks everyone for being here, Adam. Thanks for that intro. Agreed. Uh, no one likes to talk about themselves too much. Uh, it's all about the founders. Look, I'm, I'm in a privileged seat because of the people that are on this call and that dedicate their life to building a better future. At, at B, we talk a lot about machines winning and that we need to embrace that humanity. I think there's a lot of... Um, discontent around this future where machines win. But the reality is how they win is up to us. And that should enable humans to get out of the mundane, to do more of the cognitive thinking jobs, to, to manage the robots, not be a robot. And so it's sort of a thesis we have in that how the machines win is up to us. That's the future that we like to envision. Now those machines can be physical. It, it can be bits and atoms. There can be hardware, software components to it. And so we, we loosely define a machine as any sort of technology moving forward. And so that's just the, the overall thesis that we believe in, the future that we believe in, and what we invest on here at B. As Adam said, we are first investors in roughly 60% of our portfolio. Um, it's a really exciting time. Every company has a time zero. Not every company has a, has a Series C round. And so it's super inspiring. We think about it as a partnership. This is going to be a seven, eight, 10 year relationship, if not more, um, with the founders. And so we have to think about it as a partnership. That's why the name of the firm is Be Partners. Um, we also take a concentrated approach. We'll only make five or six investments a year so that we can dedicate our time and resources to uh, 
to those partnerships. And so that's a little bit about the ethos of our firm. These things take a long time to play out. We're now eight, nine years into our fund cycles and are starting to see some of the, some of the hard work we put in early payoff downstream. And so um, let's get to the Q&A because that's the best way to, to shine some more light and I can touch back on some of the, the themes we invest in here at B. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I have a lot of specific questions, I guess. Let's start more high level. Um, and I think this is, you know, a pretty general question that we that we start with a lot. But what sure. are some trends you're seeing? You know, I guess we could apply it specifically to to, to automation and AI um, and the kind of deep tech companies that you're looking at. But what are some mm -hmm. trends you're seeing right now? I guess, you know, during COVID, post COVID in this kind of time period in general. Yeah, so there's several ways to slice and dice that, right? There's specific trends within verticals, um, and then there's like horizontal trends. So one of the things we're looking at moving forward, it's a we, we have a, a thesis you can see on our website called Vector Investing. Vectors begin in a moment of, in time and, and go off in the future. Um, Adam, we can come back to that too. The What we're investing in now shouldn't be what we invested in three funds ago. And looking forward, we should be investing in different things, right? So a vector starts fund two, fund three, and goes forward. So one of the main ones we're looking at and deploying more capital to, we call it machine to machine learning. But the idea of taking humans out of the loop in certain compute situations, where can a machine talk to another machine and, there, and affect an action as a result? A really good example that we use is a company in our portfolio called Iris Automation that's a drone sense and avoid company. So it's a computer vision technology that will see an intruder aircraft, a tree has fallen in the path, um, on board the, the drone. And so imagine a drone flying along a railway doing a railroad inspection, and all of a sudden there's a down power line or something gets in its way. That onboard computer has to recognize the intrusion and then take an evasive action. And so a human can't be in the loop there. And so these computer to computer, um, not only analytics, but like prescriptions and then action takings is really a theme that we're gonna push going forward. That then gets into robotics. It gets into um, a, a robot potentially that's doing a repetitive task maybe recognizes that it's off a little bit and rather than having to have the human fix it can potentially fix and fix itself. And so M to ML, machine to machine learning, computers talking to themselves, that's going to be certainly a theme moving forward. Got it. And, and with that, it, like, did you just give an example? Was that an actual portfolio company or is that just an example that's, of? No, that's an, that's an actual portfolio company. I will try to use actual portfolio companies, not necessarily to promote them, but because they're really sure. tangible examples, right? And so in that Iris automation example, like the actual industry is logistics, is pipeline inspection, which is oil and gas, right? Package delivery. But the technology that enables that is that machine to machine drone sense and avoid technology. Got it, got it. What, uh, you know, would you mind maybe giving another one or two examples of the of the problems that some of your portfolio companies are solving with technology. Yeah, for sure. I mean, excited about. Yeah, it's like, it, it's interesting, right? Because you look for a specific point solutions and point problems. That's how you have to enter the market at the very beginning, uh, beginning of a company's journey. And then you can, yeah, then you can exp ex expand from there, right? So um, I want to keep out on the horizon and talk a little bit about our, our biological machines vector or synthetic biology. It's obviously been, very hot. We've all seen Impossible Foods, um, the clean meat revolution that's happening. But interestingly, as that starts to happen, problems then emerge in the scale up, uh, in the fermentation of some of these cell ag companies or clean meat. And so what's interesting is like as new, as humans say, okay, I'm willing to now eat lab grown meat. How do you actually get that lab grown meat to market at scale? You're going to need scale up fermenters that can can do a better job. We're going to need growth media for those proteins to, to consume. So it's like, as you push further out, the problems change. Um, and those are the kinds of problems that we need to be solving at the pre-seed. If we're solving problems of yesterday at our stage of investment, um, we're potentially inside the frontier. And so we really need to be on the frontier looking outward, solving those problems. Got it. That makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I guess it's like it's like uh, problems that you didn't know existed. Like uh, like you don't know what you don't know until you start down the path. Totally. For example, we're looking at this company now that's like, okay, you know, bots and RPA is kind of in the market. That's that's there's ex existing companies UiPath and and others that like solve some of those problems. But now 
you have 15 bots working for you or 25 bots working for you. And so now you have a problem of like trying to manage this digital workforce that you didn't even know you had before, right? And so yes, right. you kick the problem down the road to my point on, on why humans need to be in the loop. Um, it's great, the human doesn't have to do that repeat, re, um, redundant task, that mundane task, but then it creates a new problem for them and having to manage these digital workers. And so um, just yeah, an example of a, a funny like derivative problem. How big are yeah. they? That's what we try to get into, right? Some of them are small and can just be solved with a point solution. Others end up being much larger um, and have a potential network effect in behind them. Got it, got it. Mm-hmm. All right, so let's, you know, I think this is, I'm sure we have, you know, we have a lot of mm-hmm. a lot of founders here, uh, maybe first time, maybe not. Uh, but I think just talking a little bit about what you, let's say, for example, look for in a founder, um, you know, whether it's a company that, you know, you're, you're considering investing in, or maybe it's something that you is not good for your fund, but maybe good for someone, you know, one of a friend of yours fund, uh, just like what is a founder, you know, ideal founder profile look like to you? Hmm. Uh, if, we talk if there a is lot. One, if, if there is ideal, <laughs> sorry. Well, I get to try. You know, well, like we don't profile people. You have to. You have to judge on qualitative aspects at the early stage. The number one thing we look for is founder problem fit. Um, you know, in our hierarchy of things that are important in an opportunity, founder problem fit is number one. Then you get into market. Then we get into product. Often at the pre-seed, we don't get to see a product. We have, we joke internally that like a that a um, that a sorry, my phone rang. Uh, a product demo during due diligence is actually a luxury we don't get very often. Um, and so founder problem fit, empathy for the customer, empathy for the problem, whether it's I've experienced that problem in my day-to-day life and I'm now leaving my sweet job at Google to go fix it, whatever it is, um, understanding that founder problem fit makes a big deal. If it is a product-driven company and we're trying to build a market network with a good front-end product, having a deep infrastructure tech uh, CTO might not be the best fit there. It just depends on the situation. So found a problem fit for sure. Got it. So it's like you, like you're, you're clear, you're sold on the fact that, you know, there is a problem, but it's like, all right, is this founder the one to solve it? Right. Is this, is this the right person? Right. You, you got it. Right. And it's, it's tricky. And then there's other qualitative aspects about that founder. We talk about grit. Uh, we talk about being a resource magnet. That's a huge one, right? You have to sell customers, talent, and capital into your organization. We're obviously the capital stool, and yes, you have to sell us, um, but can you sell talent on joining your team? That's super important, right? And then obviously, can you sell customers? And so you have to be a resource magnet to be a founder. I think most of the founders that we're seeing are our resource magnets, um, but it's just a continual, it's a continual game you have to play. And what about, uh, I guess, specific to, you know, to your firm uh, in terms, is there, is there limitations on geo, like where the founders based Does it have to be U.S.? Um, is there, uh, do you, do you care if there's a, a solo founder versus, you know, two or three co-founders? Like do you have preferences on any of those types of aspects? Not necessarily. We are, we are North America domicile for our current fund. We may look to expand to Europe and future funds rather than that, but like you got it, we have to stay in our lane. So North America, um, definitely not Bay area, about half of our opportunities, both deal flow and investments are Bay area. Um, look, we're pre-seed investors, we have to be somewhere and it helps to have a center of gravity come to us because the universe of companies we could invest in is so wide. If we were later stage, we could probably be more out, go outreach going and go visit all these other markets. Um, Kira, our principal is located in Denver. And so that's becoming a better market for us. Um, we don't care geographically again for fit, right? It depends on what kind of, pro- what kind of business we're building. Um, if it is a product driven business, maybe the Bay area is where we need to be. Um, if it's a manufacturing business, there's definitely other markets. So we're not agnostic. We just look for the, we're not completely agnostic. We don't really care per se. We have to be here sure. to make sense for us for now. Um, yeah. In terms of the, fa- the makeup of the founding team, again, it, it, like, it depends. Being a solo founder is really hard. Um, we often then end up filling the role of co-founder with a checkbook, especially at the early stage where we're, we're going back and forth with the founders a lot. There's some founders in our office right now. Um, doing some of that. So we don't mind solo founders. We tend to have a bias towards having at least some technical ability on the, on the founding team, if it's a sole founder. Um, but the best companies are gen- we generally find are, are two founders, but no hard and fast rules around that. Um, to your okay. point where you made fun of me earlier, I am from a ski town, but tend to not potentially back founders from a ski town. Um, I think that it's a choice of, of lifestyle, which I totally respect. Um, but we're here cranking, you know, cranking 80 hour a week. So different, different That's discussion. Right. Um, yeah. 
And then we tend, we actually also stay away from husband and wife teams. Um, I, Ooh, it's a lot of eggs in one basket. It's a lot of eggs in one basket. And so while there are exceptions and there are scenarios where that's worked out, um, it's just a lot. You have your your best friend, your husband, your father of your children, all in one basket and your business partner. Um, and so that's a lot of risk that um, can be mitigated. So that's kind of an internal role for us as well. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I, I, uh, I thought about, I've even thought about that one before, like, oh, would I ever, you know, go into business with my wife? And it's like, you know, on the surface, I would, oddly enough. Um, but, you know, talking to you more, it's like, I, I probably would never do that. Probably not a good idea. Yeah, but. you trust her. You guys operate. You know how you know how it goes, right? There's less friction in some ways, um, but on the other hand, like that's just a lot. It's a lot to take. Yeah, it's also there, there can also be a lot more friction. <laughs> so yeah, no I get doubt. it. I get it. Um, you know what? I'm going to take a. I see a question here in the Q and A that I'm going to read off. And if you don't mind answering, yes, it. go for it. So, hi, Barrett. Hi, Garrett. Can you explain your pre-seed funding venture? Can you also expound on moving? from the ideal phase to concept. Thank you. Yeah, I, thought, I saw this from Byron. I'm not quite sure, explain our pre-seed mm. funding venture, like the criteria, I wasn't quite sure on that question. Um, oh, sorry, I, I didn't realize you were looking at these as well. <laughs> no, yeah, I'll I'll just... I'm looking at too. So I don't really understand that question, but let's go to that second part on, can you expand on moving from the ideal phase to concept? Yeah, look, zero to one, one to relevance, relevance to scale. That's how we break down the sort of three areas. We focus on zero to one, right? That's going to be go to market. That's going to be finding your first customers. And it's going to be creating processes and systems inside the startup under a, we call it dry, don't repeat yourself. And so if we're finding ourselves onboarding customers manually in a specific way, what can we automate from that, right? What can we continue to pull away from the human inside our own business to then make a repeatable and a scalable um, scalable system. Uh, custom onboarding just happens to be one that at the very beginning, it's a lot of handholding. We have to pay attention to our first five customers, but then how can we make that sixth, seventh, eighth customer easier to onboard, easier to easier to uh, land as a full-time repeating, repeatable customer? Um, and so, look, MVP is the way to go. I didn't invent that. I didn't invent that playbook, right? Steve Blank, uh, um, get out of the building and, and get that MVP in the hands of users. We like to see that speed. And frankly, during our due diligence and as we're looking at a company, <clears throat> seeing that activity is a, the best thing you can do, right? Like showing us velocity, showing us that you're a resource magnet. We're going to be in due diligence for 30, 45 days. Like what can you accomplish besides other investor conversations during that time? That's a huge tip um, because then that creates the FOMO. It builds the scarcity um, that, that helps you land a VC. Yeah. Awesome. See, I'm gonna I'm gonna get to a couple more of these uh, unless unless you want to pick one, but I was gonna go with uh, the oh wait these are already answered. Sorry about that. Um, did you already answer this? It, it, uh, if the machines have won, what does life look like for everyday workers and uh, people? Yeah, you uh -huh. did, right? Well, that was my, yeah, yeah, that was my point, right? It's like you, the the it looks like the worker, yeah, then being then operating at a higher cognitive level or managing the machines, right? So um, they're going to continue to win and win at the mundane when you're doing the creative and the thoughtful. Right, absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, do you invest in consumer hardware? No, no, that's too hard for us. We're not consumer, we do deep tech, deep tech in the enterprise. I'm not a, I'm not a consumer guy. And so I think that as a firm, we understand the purchase behavior, the rational decision-making behind enterprise buying. Sometimes that a company can then go to consumer after they've after they've approached the enterprise. So you might see in our portfolio one or two consumer opportunities, but generally speaking, they started with the B two B application, um, and then you complete you, you add consumer and hardware. That's just really hard. Um, there are firms out there that do it and they do it really well, but not us. Cool. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, you know I think we on Meet the VC we talk about this a lot because it is a lot of early stage founders, uh, maybe first time, maybe not, but. Talk a little bit about you know a what a first time founder what their approach should be. Never really raised venture capital. Um, you know maybe they have been fundraising and gone through that painful process already. Maybe they haven't even started. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. You know what would some general advice be to your first time founder yeah, right? fundraising? Not 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 specific to you know to your vertical. Yeah, and that's a good that's a good comment too. In general, on the first time versus second time founders, we're certainly as we've matured as a firm and now have gone from like. No one knew who B Partners was eight years ago to at least like some brand recognition. 
we're seeing more second time founders come in. It's interesting because like there's a little bit less drag around them, more um, more quicker decision making, but that's not necessarily always a recipe for better success. Um, experience is the best teacher. It's also the toughest teacher. Test first, lesson later, and so then you're trying to pay it forward. So to your question on the first time founder, solve for partnership. Um, if you're if you're simply trying to solve for dilution, that's never going to be a long term uh, strat winning strategy. I shouldn't say never, but if you find the right partner that can pay for the lessons that they've learned, and that's a lot of what I view my job as, is I learned something from one of our founders on Tuesday, I share it with another founder on Thursday. And it's not going to be specifically the same thing. It's going to be like, let me tell you a story about how this decision was made. Maybe there's something in there that helps you make a better decision here. And so solve for partnership because it's going to be a long road. You want it to be a long road. Maybe it's the next company that they back of yours as well. So that's my number one advice um, for the first time founders. The, the tactical advice then is around like faster decision making, um, trying to clo close down feedback loops because it is your first time. And so like you haven't been through the equity, the equity um, grant process. And so if you have a good partner, they can help you with that. Um, know when to just take their advice and say, look, I've interviewed these three CFOs and early growth is the best, go with them. Great, I'll just take that advice versus like, hey, I've interviewed these three product manager types. I think you actually need to talk to them all. And so know how to spend your time um, with that partner, where to dig in, where to just take their advice. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting because you have, I think, uh, you know, like I was saying before, where you don't know what you don't know, it's like for the first time founders, it's like that's, you know, every part of the process is new, right? So they're learning all along the way, whether they get a second or third meeting, whether they get rejected, whether, you know, whatever it is. So I think, what about um, something as simple as getting in touch with you? I mean, obviously they can see your email and, and your contact info, but, uh, you know. Yeah, so Garrett, Garrett at B Partners, right? And then now we're, I, I have an associate, which is awesome, but we have Kira as principal and then Ola as an associate that help us. Um, Cause imagine, you can imagine at the pre-seal have a really wide funnel to start and it's kind of a shallow and then we go deep. We can't go deep on every opportunity. Um, and so we have to sort of funnel quickly and sift quickly. And so in those intro emails, right? Why are we on scope? Um, what, what's, what's the fit that will help us surface the right opportunities to the top of the pile. So you know, Garrett at bpartners.vc, you can also submit on our website. We read every single email for sure. Um, so that's that. And then uh, Hassan Ali had a question here on the right time to raise funds. Um, it depends on your business and, the, and how you want to build it. Um, I don't actually have enough information specifically to answer that question about this company. Generally speaking, like as late as possible, the more of an MVP you can get out there, the more traction you can create, um, are we pre or post revenue? The further you can kick the can down the road without fully hamstringing the company is going to be better for you as the founder from both a dilution standpoint, from understanding of your customer standpoint, um, sitting in the diligence meeting with the VC, answering questions about product market fit, that's really going to help. So the easy answer is as late as possible, um, but obviously you run out of money. Number one rule of business is don't go out of business. So got to be careful, but um, yeah, push it, push it out. If you can, we would much rather have you raise funds from your customers than from your investors. What about, what is your approach to hiring or your advice that you give to, you know, mm -hmm. generally speaking hire, to your portfolio company? Hire slow, fire fast. Um, you know, these are, these are partnerships again. And if, if you have an instinct that this isn't the right fit, just move along. It's going to be better for both parties. It's really hard to do. These are hard conversations to have. Um, easy for me to just say that on a call, but um, the best operators in our portfolio, especially during COVID period a year ago said, Hey, look, um, we just have to tighten our belt here. And here's the deal. Half of the employees end up saying, you know what, how about we take a take a pay cut instead and you can keep John over here as well. And so um, those that those in our portfolio that took it head on and were willing to fire fast when it came down to it performed much better through the through the through the pandemic and in general, right? Um, because all of a sudden yeah. you get to the end of your runway and you should have you should have gotten rid of four people, you know, six months ago, because then you have that extra quarter of runway to potentially make a breakthrough and now you don't have it. So um, right. It's hard. Hiring's hard. Uh, yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Tell me about it. So I, yeah, it was funny because I was reading a book this morning where uh, the advice that this accountant was giving was to his to his clients was that you know hire at the last possible moment. Like don't sort of lead with scaling up your team. Like okay, you know you get capital, hundred percent. Start to hire. Yeah. So I, I, that that was like where I was trying to. Is that is that typically your same? You're on the same wavelength there. Yeah, right. I mean, in the same vein that I said, like raise funds as late as possible. Yes, you want to hire to fit the need, not hire out ahead. Now there's opportunistic times. Um, I can think of a company that raised a big series A and they opportunistically hired um, this, this exec. And like, in theory, it was really good, but it was actually too early. Like he was awesome. And we took advantage of the situation to bring him on. We probably couldn't have gotten him otherwise. Um, In the long run, it actually didn't work out, which was kind of surprising. But look, if there's an opportunity to bring on somebody great, then do it. Um, one super tactical note is around Series A and potentially hiring a uh, hiring manager. Um, that's so meta, but one of the best pieces of advice from our series early Series A founders that we've passed on to the portfolio is, okay, you get through pre-seed, seed. As soon as you raise that Series A, bring on somebody to handle the hiring, especially as the founder that's going to free up so much time and bandwidth. Yes, you're going to still end up, you're the CEO, you're going to end up making the decisions, but bringing somebody on to support the hiring like right after series a is a is a good nugget of wisdom um and again don't just do it for the sake of doing it. it has to be the right person has to be the right fit maybe your business isn't necessarily ramping hiring after the a but just something to think about for sure um yeah. but yeah hire, hiring is the hardest thing resource magnet customers talent and capital so um yeah. it's going to be different for every company what is uh, what is B Partners' take on on like, whether or not you take board seats? Like, how do you guys approach that typically? Or is there... uh, always governance is super always. important in my opinion. Um, but don't always you don't always take a board seat. I've been on nine boards. I think I'm on six now. Um, I take it seriously. Not in the not in the Roberts rules. I, I'm not like one grinding you on like board dynamics. It creates two way accountability. Um, we have to have a conversation about something. Like you can't just open up a convertible note and start raising money. At least you have to talk to me about it. Um, it keeps me up to date on the company so I can be super efficient when I'm when I'm pitching your business or talking to later stage investors. Um, and, and good governance, we've written on this, good governance starts at the seed. So we get to the series A, we pull in Sequoia, all of a sudden it's your first board meeting ever. Like that's not a good look. And so have training that muscle is really important. We believe it just, it builds for a much better organizational presence. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and interestingly uh, on that, Adam, I actually I actually host a becoming a better board member quarterly meetup. I used to do it in person here in the office for the next generation of VCs, where we can actually like talk about our problems as like, okay, we're board members, or thinking of becoming a board member, or where does our liability stand? Or and so we there's no training for us on that. That's one of the hardest things in our in our industry. And so I'm trying to get better at it and make my peer group better at it. A board director at the seed and pre-seed is certainly different than the series A and beyond. Um, and so we're just trying to like be good stewards, not create drag. We're trying to reduce drag. So, you know, not create drag around the board, but really make the board an asset, especially um, as companies start to accelerate. Mm-hmm. So you'll so you'll typically you'll stay as an as a board member through the whole process. If you have a company that is, you know, going through the ABC and beyond. You guys will stay on board that whole time. Uh, it's this is one of the hardest things in my job. Um, t- time allocation in general is the hardest thing in my job. But the staying on board, so because you'll have look, I have access to some of the Midas list guys. We're on a board together, so it creates a collision with them once a month or once a quarter, where we get to talk about opportunities, hear how they think. How could that not be good for me personally, for our firm, for me to then pass on to the founders? On the other hand, like I'm a, now on a Series C board of a chemical company. Like, is that good use of my time when I should be helping out the next founder with those three or four marginal hours. So it's a really hard thing for us. Um, but I do get removed. Sometimes I go to observer, um, which is like kind of tough because I have to spend the time anyway, but then at the same time, I'm not in the room for some of the decisions. Also to note is that when we get later stage, I'm on the same team as the founder. We're old school shareholders. I have a really interesting perspective on the company and the people course, yeah. that is generally welcomed by the later stage board members um, and, and or by the, the CEO, especially if there's a new CEO, sometimes it comes in and the founder transitions. So um, mm. generally speaking, I will try to stay on as long as possible. Um, there's certainly, it's not an ego thing. And if I'm asked to remove, be removed, no problem. Oftentimes I'll go to an independent 
and then say, good, now let's try to replace me with somebody who is an industry expert. So that ends up being a good situation because That's at least great. I can support, I can support through the transition. Nothing weird happens during the transition. And then we replace me with somebody awesome. And then I go help the next, the next founder out. So I do my, we do our best work at the beginning. There's no question. Um, those later stage boards are, are trickier, trickier time uses. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. And that, and that's, uh, I mean, you are, I mean, if you're getting, if you're getting in at the pre-seed level, you are essentially a co-founder, right? You, it's probably, it feels like it. it's probably, the, I mean, you're Yeah. It's like, you're there probably before employee number five. So yeah, that's <laughs> right. Sense. No, I, like most of the time it's before employee number five. Now pre, pre-seed and seed has almost been bifurcated in its own, in the, in the last couple of years. Um, yeah. And COVID was a little harder. Like we ended up, just straying more towards the seed rounds, which is that's not necessarily where we have the best value add to founders. We, we continue to try to push earlier um, into the pre-seed and that that helps us avoid competition from the later stage funds as well. Mm. No, no. I actually, I see a, I see a question here that I, that I yeah. was going to, to ask you earlier, but so it was about when people are reaching out to you, right? And they're trying to get your attention. Uh, what is it ideally that you want to see in terms of, I know you mentioned, you know, the, the types of, you know, content for, fit and, and all that, but um, do you prefer to have a one pager or, or is, is just a paragraph in the con in the body of the email better? Like what's the, the most efficient way to catch your eye? I mean, I mean, the best way is to have a founder or entrepreneur that we know introduce or share your materials. That is actually the best way um, because then they validated you a little bit. So, but we try to be open to, you know, not to different ge geographies and, and different groups because that's how you find diamonds in the rough. You don't find diamonds in the rough walking down the fairway. So um, sure. if it is a cold reach out, which we have done a couple of you know direct deals, we call them. Um, we, yes, have a succinct statement on what it is, um, why it's on scope. And then you wanna have a teaser deck of some kind, right? Cause we talk about this process as a breadcrumb trail. We have to go raise funds from LPs. We help our companies raise funds from series A investors have to lead us on the breadcrumb trail, right? And so enough to keep, get us interested, but then want to take those next steps. Um, and each breadcrumb mm. trail is different. So um, yeah, just great. know that we get a lot of, we do get a lot of blind and we read them, um, but it's, it's hard. It's, there's a lot of noise for sure in general. Yeah, that's interesting. From a, you know, from a sales perspective, you're always wondering, I mean, obviously, like you said, when it's a warm reach out and it's introduction, that's a different ball game. And to the person that asked that question, I would always check maybe using LinkedIn, do I have a, a second, a third degree connection to, to get that, you know, that I can, totally. I can come in through. I mean, yeah, that's a when good, I first really started, good I could answer through. every LinkedIn. I was like, I could answer every LinkedIn. I would have these dialogues and now it's like, it stacks up. And so it's in yeah. theory, I try to be as wide open as possible, but yeah, second or third degree um, really helps for sure. Great. All right. Awesome. I, I like this uh, question you know from I, Warren, Warren here. Can we have about the labor shortages in ag? Um, I think that that's certainly going to happen. The AI autonomous harvesting of ag products, for sure. There's a lot of interesting stuff out there. Um, one thing that I like that dawned on me was like, okay, so you have a robot and the robot can, the computer vision system can like identify that it's a strawberry versus a leaf. But then like, is a gripper going to go crush the strawberry when it picks it? And so there's all these like little secondary issues that are, that are resulting are like, can peaches really be harvested by robot or is that same thing going to happen, right? We're going to ruin the peach when that, when you harvest it um, versus like an almond is harvested because the shaker goes and shakes the tree. And so there's already a lot of it in there and it'll only continue to get better. Um, what I, what I'm really interested in as well is the machine to machine aspect. So one of our companies is called Interplant and they genetically modify the plant so that when it's under duress or under stress, it's you and I might see it because it turns brown three weeks later, but it's actually been under stress um, for a while, whether it's a fungus or too much water or not enough water. And so if inner plant modifies the plant so that when it's under stress, it puts off a signal that's detectable by a drone or satellite, then all of a sudden you can look at the field where the human eye looks at it and doesn't really know. And the data sensor in the ground is those are proven to kind of be non-accurate or, or tough. Um, can then inner plant talk to the harvester or talk to another robot to go potentially investigate. So that's what's really interesting. It's like that, that's in that machine to machine learning or the, M, the machine to machine concept. Um, but yeah, ag in the harvesting of products is real for sure. 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask another one of the questions here that you, I don't know if you, mm -hmm. you did or didn't see it, but it, it, it may or may not apply um, just based on the fact that you're you know, doing enterprise work, not with consumers, but uh, how do you handle um, a uh, situation where you had, you were buying, you know, your buyer is the CFO of a company, let's say, or a hospital in this case, but the user is the doctors and nurses, right? So the, the user adoption is, is, is there, or at least like, you know, they they love the product, but then how do you then tie that to getting the buy-in from the, from the buyer? It's a great example. Like healthcare is really yeah. tricky. We have several question. healthcare companies in the portfolio and I've learned here, I've learned a couple of things. One, the, if you're going to sell from the top, top down and bottom up is the answer. So know which way you're going. If we're going top down, it has to be a top five issue for the CEO, right? And how we frame it going into that seat, going into that discussion is important, right? Because like the actual problem might be very specific that the startup solving, but if it's like employ, you know, a patient um, NPS has got to be a top five issue, right? You've got to have happy patients, right? Or clinical ROI. So if you can frame it as something that's a top five issue, but then here's how we solve that top five issue, because that's going to be a monster, right? Patient happiness or patient NPS. So that's an important way to sell from top down. From bottoms up, we've had a company in our portfolio called DeepScribe that sells a voice scribe to doctors that then like takes the, listens to what the doctor is saying, the conversation, annotates the note. That's the technology is it takes that voice, annotates the notes into a real doctor's note, a human then to the point on the humans and machines, a human, instead of being a one-to-one -one scribe where the scribe would be in the room, writing it down as a doctor did it. Now the scribe can do three or four doctors at once, at, not at once, but three or four doctor ratio because they can just watch the notes that are annotated coming out of the voice transcription. Um, and so DeepScribe's done a really good job of selling from the bottoms up, going to the doctors themselves and saying, hey, look, if we tried to sell this from the top down, we would have to position it as a mental health of the doctors or efficiency of the practice. That's a really tough lift. But they were able to go and sell from the bottom up just straight to the doctor saying 500 bucks a month will provide you this software plus service. It'll save you hours. And so they really started organically from the ground up selling into the system. Now that we have the data that we uh, that the doctors are validating it, telling their other doctors about it, we can potentially go top down in the system. So um, it's really hard when the buyer is not the user. Oftentimes, just be conscious about tops up versus bottoms down. Yeah, yeah, that's a complicated issue. That's uh, definitely an enterprise sales uh, challenge in general. That's right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And hospital. I mean, I'm seeing that question now. That hospital yeah. is just the perfect example, right? Um, that's a big one, sure. Yep, it's hard. And then the user, like, um, because you might be selling on clinical plus financial ROI to the hospital. And so then if the user does align with either one of those, maybe that's the angle we take and say, okay, look, let's focus on the clinical ROI here because the, the nurse is the user or the doctor is the user and maybe that they can be the buyer because they're the chief of practice um, because maybe it's a PCP versus a large system. So it just try to create alignment in that the best you can. And that may be just as much around messaging as it is around the actual user versus buyer. Mm. Yeah. Uh, shifting a little bit, I, I see another question here that, that is also a question I, I'd like to ask. Uh, do you Have you guys made investments in the cannabis or hemp space, uh, specifically around technology? And um, I have, a, and I have, I have a second to uh -huh. add on to that, sorry to interrupt you. And then also, uh, the same thing applies to psychedelics, which is a newer you know newer market, but still exploring. Yeah, I, I actually just read How to Change Your Mind, Michael Pollack's book. Um, it's actually fascinating. Yeah. Really about the history of psychedelics and how, they, how we got here. So to answer your question, no, B Partners doesn't really do Syntech. Um, I've made a couple of personal investments in friends, friends of friends. Uh, I got a buddy that's a really good cannabis investor. And so he kind of drags me to some, some things. In the wild west, the immature stack, it's kind of similar to synthetic biology. And that almost, it's almost like look for the brands first. So we looked for the brand because it was a wide open brand category. You know, that was three or four years ago. Then my second one was in um, the logistics tax test transport stack. Um, so I sort of applied the way we look at new industries as stacks and synthetic biology into cannabis. The reality is no, we don't really do that. There are some investors out there that do. Um, I can potentially direct you to one or two of them, but the ones I've done have been just personal relationships. Great, good stuff, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see here, uh, I guess we're, let's see where, Closing in on 10 minutes here. Uh, is there anything oh. that 
you, uh, I guess, thought you might get asked or were thinking about talking about that, that you haven't touched on? <laughs> no, I appreciate that the questions are theoretical and like not like, hey, what do you think of my startup? Because that's like, you know, having a conversation, developing a relationship, that's the best way to get financed, right? Um, whether it's at the pre-seed at my stage, now our window may be a little shorter, or now we're really encouraging our founders to develop relationships with the Series A and beyond guys. We used to not say that. I've changed my tune on that. Um, when I first started, it was like, no, this is going to waste your time. Use that information against you to invest in somebody else. Now there's so much money and competition out there. It's really a founder-friendly environment um, to that degree, and developing those relationships is a good use of time. Maybe you allocate an hour or two a week or a month to have those coffee chats with VCs ahead of any fundraise. Um, because we're still sort of creatures and emotional creatures. And, and the number one, number one trait you have to have as a VC is being able to deal with FOMO. And so that's an emotional thing. And so, especially at the early stage, we don't have a lot of data to go on. We can go on market size. We can go on like, you know, potential network effect. There is some data, but really it becomes about um, getting to that conviction there's a leap of faith we have to make at the beginning. We can diligence ourselves out of every deal if we keep going. So how do you get us to that moment of leap of faith, leap of faith and how do we cross that? Um, and it's different for every investor, for sure. Uh, Vladimir, no, what? sorry, it's not, it's not open to non-VCs. Um, but we might start publishing some of our, we have payloads that we give to our, our portfolio. Thing, you know, like a payload, something that you drop in right, right when they needed things around PR. Um, hiring payload. We do have one on board and governance. So we might make that public. That would be one we make public. Um, but no, the better board member breakfast is just for our VC group. I guess the last question I have that I, that I, uh, that I did want to mention or just get your take on is, um, I know it's a common theme here. We're kind of entering the post COVID phase um, of the economy of, of the world. Um, and you mentioned before you have, uh, you know, one of your portfolio companies is, is in the office. What are you saying? And I know your earlier stage, so you know maybe this doesn't apply as much as when teams are 50, 100 employees. But what are you seeing in terms of uh, empl uh, employee teams returning to physical spaces, uh, you know, visiting customers, prospects, that kind of thing? Mm -hmm. I'm all about getting out of the building and visiting customers. That's an important thing. Um, there's certainly a, a really good world around hybrid. Uh, depends on what you do for the organization. Do you need to be collaborative? Like if you're a product manager versus a backend builder, those things might have different needs in terms of physical space. Like I just believe proximity builds better products personally. Again, we're human beings at the early stage, like the swivel chair effect is real. Being able to swivel in your chair and talk to the guy about the problem you're building or, hey, what if I do this? How does that affect you? Versus if you're potentially building something in the back end or an individual contributor, um, as organizations grow, it could be more prudent and time effective to not to not be in the office. So finding the right the right mix there will be an important additional trait of founders kind of under the, the team and culture building header is like tactically, how do we actually come back to the office or what do we want to do for our office? Um, that'll be a, a thing that founders have to answer. Yep, this is true. Uh, great. I mean, I, I uh... I'm out of questions personally. Um, should a, I, uh, should a startup focus? Uh, should a startup focus on being customer centric from a very early stage? Absolutely. With like from time zero. Interestingly, we see sometimes in the deeper tech, like it's hard because like you go do some customer development, like some maybe some of the cell ag me cell ag for example. Like yes, we know that there's a market out there for vegan cheese that's like tastes good like there's a little bit of a market can we build something sell ag that's actually real cheese that's better right so you kind of know but then you have to go into build mode deep tech biology whatever it is and sometimes we'll see our, our founders get too far away from the customer and that can be really dangerous so yes always especially in product businesses stay close if it's a little deeper tech and requires some build just check in along the way to make sure you're not deviating from the course too much because then when it's time to get back to the customer um that then you can it's not it's not a really heavy lift you're there so no question um stay close to your customers find out what they need because their preferences might change as well yeah fantastic you see anything else interesting there that you can uh touch on or should we cut should we bring it to a close here uh, i guess this last one do you ever invest in companies that are building a customer product service software um, but have a long-term top-down enterprise. Tricky, 
I, we could see it where it's like, to my deep scribe example, like they start from bottoms up, but the customer is still generally within the enterprise. Long term, yes, switching is possible, but at the early stage, I wouldn't necessarily lead with that. Um, that can be like a, you know, once once you have the investors, you can talk about that. I mean, the boardroom and strategy, strategy sessions about how do we like transition to the enterprise, but just be careful because all of a sudden we're we're not focused enough at the beginning if you're talking about consumer and enterprise. Great. Well, this is awesome. I, you know, I know a lot of um, seed and series A uh, VC firms, but I don't know a lot of pre-seed. So this is like really unique. And um, thank you for being Sweet. so you know open and, and straightforward yeah. and, and all that insightful. Hey. So I'll let, I'll let Gina close it out. And thank you to the partners. Love all you guys. Thank you so much for what you guys do. And anyone listening, if you have any questions about any of, any of our services or anything, please reach out. Thank you to Thanks, you, guys. Adam. You were amazing and you were able to really kind of guide this and direct it. And thank you so much for all that you did. Thank you, Alejandro. And thank you so much, Garrett, again, for being a part of it. You guys were incredible and amazing. And it was very, it was very interesting. I'm, I'm love learning about all this stuff. So thank you so much to all involved and to you, our guests who joined us today. You know, as we mentioned, we do this the second Wednesday of every month. So feel free to join us. On July 14th, we're going to be talking with Anthos, Sam Tiedon from Anthos Capital. So you can find out more information about upcoming webinars at our website, Early Growth, or you can always catch these past webinars on our YouTube channel. With that being said, we wanted to say thank you to everyone, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Have a great week, everyone. Thanks, all. Have a great week. Bye, guys. Thanks. Cheers.